Hey there, listeners. So, today, what we have for you, we have an interview with Mike Bergner. Mike Bergner is a Level 5 Senior International Weightlifting Coach from the States. He runs a national training facility from his home in Bonsol, California. The facility is known as Mike's Gym, aptly named. Um, he is the head of CrossFit's weightlifting program, teaching all these uh, fast exercises how to actually move like a weightlifter should move. And uh, he's done a lot in the sport. He's coached the national team of the USA national team uh, in the junior women's uh, the junior women's category for uh, for a long period of time. He also coached his son Casey to some uh, some great heights in his career as well. So we have a pretty good discussion here with Mike talking about uh, the relationship coaching children. So uh, what he's had to go through there. Uh, we also discuss weight gain techniques for athletes and the thousand calorie uh, smoothies with ice cream and chocolate chip cookies and all the good stuff that he used to feed his son Casey. We talk about the foundation uh, foundations of weightlifting, and we also talk about many other cool things. We talk about how to approach a PR from the athlete's perspective and from the coach's perspective, coaching an athlete who wants to PR like we all do every day when we train, but sometimes we'd be silly. So. Really good chat with uh, with Mike, also known as uh, Coach B, to a lot of a lot of you guys out there. So, hope you guys enjoy it. Um, this was actually a Skype interview. It'd be nice if you couldn't tell, but you'll probably pick that up. It was a Skype interview that we did. Uh, it's actually our first ever Skype interview. So, any feedback, email radio at adventurefittravel.com. Email me personally, doc at adventurefittravel.com. Write on our Instagram, write on our Facebook. Give us feedback, guys, because we can get big name guests for you, but a lot of them will have to be Skype. Um, we just want to know how you feel about it. So let us know. We want to please the listeners. That's what we're about. We want to make as good a show as we can for you guys. So before we get into the show, our sponsors are Audible. So Audible is uh, the widest selection in the world of digital audiobooks, including bestsellers, new releases, exclusives, and much more. Listen anytime, anywhere on your tablet, mobile, or desktop with their free app. Audible is offering listeners of Adventure Fit Radio a free audiobook and a 30-day trial to check them out. So, to do that, guys, head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio. Again, that is audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio for your free audiobook. Last week, I recommended The Martian. It is an epic read. Uh, read, listen, whatever you want to call it. If you haven't seen the movie, check it out. It's 10 hours of a movie playing in your head. It's that amazing. If you have seen the movie, download the audiobook anyway because it's uh, it's a ripper. It's amazing. Um, I'll recommend more audiobooks as we go with Audible. Um, pretty big reader myself, but I'm going to stick with The Martian for the time being. Get on that, guys. We're also sponsored by Loxam Solutions. Loxam is a boutique consulting and business support company focused on business consulting and commercial services. The key to their success has been through the application of a pragmatic approach combined with entrepreneurial spirit to achieve their clients' outcomes. Their philosophy is simple. Deliver well-defined, measurable business outcomes to their clients through the engagement of subject matter experts with real-world experience. www.loxamsolutions.com.au Go and check them out. NDO Supps is another one of our sponsors. They're a newly formed company that aspires to blah, blah, blah. The copy is a little dull that they sent, so I'm better off telling you guys the truth. And the truth is, Mac, my co-host, loves NDO Supps, swears by them. He's got a really good relationship with the owner as well. Um, they backed us in, guys. Back them in. Check out for all your supplement needs, NDO Supps at www.ndosupps.com and use ADVF Radio for 10% off. Finally, this podcast is brought to you by Adventure Fit Travel. That's the parent company of this podcast, guys. What we do is we take you all over the world. We train, we travel, we adventure. We just have tons of fun. Check out the trips that we got going on. We've got a couple of spots left on our USA CrossFit Games Tour. By the time you hear this, they'll probably be sold out. But uh, check them out. You might, be, you might be lucky. We've also got Everest Base Camp coming up in September. Last week's show with Gerardo Lopez would hopefully have got you guys excited about that. Come and check out Everest and, uh, and the Kumbu and Nepal region with Adventure Fit Travel. 
And we are also in the process of releasing three more new trips. Again, by the time this podcast is released in a few days, we may have released one or two of those. Hints. uh, No, I'm not giving you any hints. All right. So without further ado, here is Coach B, Mike Bergner. All right, guys, welcome to Adventure Fit Radio. We are sitting here with uh, Mike Bergner. Uh, I've got Mac on my right and Tommy to my left. Okay, guys. Before we, uh, before we throw to Mike, we're just going to go through the regular process. Tommy's got a song that he's written and uh, Tommy's tribute. Here we go. Hey, Mike, thanks for coming on the show, mate. I've uh, done a bittersweet symphony cover for you and uh, I've written a couple of words. So I really hope you enjoy it. <laughs> we'll see how we go. <laughs> Well, we're sitting here with a man named Mike. He's a man to be clear. He's a weightlifting coach. If you want to get stronger, he's the man to approach. (laughs) His last name is Bergner. The only word I could find that rhymed was burger. <laughs> he used to play football. I've seen his picture up in the shopping mall. <laughs> Ooh, no change, I can't change, I can change, I can change. My snatch technique Can you make it magnifique? Because I want to be the best CrossFit athlete I can be That's why I need you to help me I need you to help me I just can't wait to talk to you about Training, diet, and all the cool things involved So let's get involved, oh yeah Everyone at home, he's the man, the myth, the legend, Coach Mike Bergener. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a long one, Tommy. Yeah, very long one. That was good. I, I'm not sure about the shopping mall. You better go to the post office. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's right. It just sort of rhymed with, uh, with what I needed. So um, <laughs> yeah. I haven't actually seen your face up there, but um, it would be great. <laughs> So, Mike, we've got, uh, we've got 30, 40 minutes with you, so uh, why don't you quickly give our listeners a bit of background into uh, who you are and your, a bit of a background in your, uh, in your weightlifting career. Well, I'm Coach B, as people call me. Uh, Mike Burton is my name. I, I don't even know that name anymore. It's just Coach B, and I turn around. Mike Burton, I don't turn around. Um, but I was, uh, I was a, a senior five or a level five senior international coach for the United States weightlifting team. And I was a, a, a junior world team coach for 10 years for the women's team. And I was a senior world team coach for the men's team uh, one year. And uh, I got into CrossFit in 2005 when Coach Classman brought his, his uh, athletes down to take a USA weightlifting course, which I was running for USA weightlifting. Mm-hmm. And uh, he asked me to come on board with him to do uh, CrossFit weightlifting and, uh, you know, do seminars and, and uh, you know, teach coaches and, and athletes how to properly perform safely and efficiently and effectively the snatch and the clean and jerk. And that's basically how it got started. Beautiful. So um, when you went into the CrossFit side of it, was there much backlash from your weightlifting, uh, your weightlifting counterparts? Um, oh, yeah. Sure, they thought I was crazy. They didn't... Uh, yeah, I bet. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't get over the, the, 30, the 30 snatches and the 30 clean and jerks for, for time. And, uh, and I tried to explain to them that, they, that it wasn't about that. It was about people snatching and clean and jerking. And then the kids of those people, of those athletes, 
would be watching mom and dad's uh, snatching and cleaning and jerking, and then they would want to do the same thing mom and dad would do. And mm-hmm. we would uh, build up a membership of, of CrossFitters that, uh, with the kids primarily in mind that would, uh, would revolutionize the uh, weightlifting in the United States. Absolutely. And, uh, we've gone from 2,500 when I talked to them to over, I think, fifteen to 20,000 members now. Wow. Mm. So what, um, what initially drew you into the sport of CrossFit um, from weightlifting? Mike? Well, I when Glassman came down and we started talking about what this this new way of training was, uh, I thought it was cross training, not cross fit. And he corrected me, and he he uh, we put two of our athletes up against each other, and a guy by the name of Greg Amison, who I you probably know, and then Josh Everett, who you know. Mm-hmm. Josh was my athlete, and Greg Amison was coach's athlete. And uh, Greg was uh, uh, the number one guy in the United States with this new method of training. And so we, when they came down to my gym in, uh, at my school, we put them head to head and Josh beat him. Mm, right and so we, we started, Coach was really, that was unbelievable because Co- Josh was one of my Olympic weightlifters. And, and that was, was just, through, just through technique? You think that he, that he got past it or...? No, no, I just, think, I just, what, what is the workout where they do, uh, I think they did pull-ups and kettlebells. Helen. Helen. Run? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Josh beat him and, uh, you know, Josh, he wasn't doing any, uh, any of that kind of stuff, but he Josh is a good athlete. I mean, he's fast, he's strong, uh, he's, he's fit, uh, but he, he didn't specifically train for CrossFit, but he did a, a lot of Olympic weightlifting. He was a national caliber weightlifter. Yep. And, yeah. and so uh, when he beat him, Coach and I struck up a, a friendship, and we started every week giving each other workouts. And and uh, I would call Coach and tell him what Josh did, and, and he'd call me and tell me what Emerson did, and, <laughs> and they'd just go back and forth. And he wasn't even doing seminars then. And uh, one day he called me up and says, hey, we're going to be doing a seminar in Colorado. And uh, we'd like for you to come and present the, uh, you know, the snatch and the clean and jerk. And uh, you got three hours to do it. And uh, I said, yeah, I'd be glad to do it. But three hours isn't going to be enough. And uh <laughs> He says, well, just, just do the burden or warm up and the skill transfer exercises. And that's what I did in my class. And basically, I taught first responders, Navy SEALs, Marine Force Recon, mm-hmm. you know, Delta Force guys, uh, the same way I taught my kids in the high school mm-hmm. for three hours. And we did the burden or warm up and the skill transfer exercises. And, and that was it. And there wasn't anybody in those classes that could do an overhead squat with PVC pipe. Well, yeah. right. Well, um, so just before, Mike, you mentioned that uh, uh, you copped a bit of flack from your uh, weightlifting uh, companions and friends. And uh, what's your view on uh, the touch and go reps in weightlifting and uh, sorry, uh, in CrossFit as I used to uh, see a, a weightlifting coach. And uh, for two or three years, or for, sorry, for, I started for two years, I was never allowed to do any touch and go reps. And uh, he's still quite old school and very traditional weightlifting um, or weightlifter. And he's very appreciative of what weightlifting has done for, or sorry, what CrossFit has done for weightlifting. But did you, did you cop much uh, slack? Because you were sort of the pioneer weightlifter for CrossFit. Um, how did you go about dealing with, the, uh, with those type of comments? Well, it was really hard at first because I'm a technique guy, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and I'll give you a story. It's, 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 uh, my, uh, my daughter-in-law, Natalie, who was a 2008 Olympian, Natalie Bergner. Um, first time she ever did Isabel, she did it in, uh, seven minutes and 30 seconds because she did the typical weightlifting stuff, right? She, she, um, um, you know, put the bar down, got set up again and, and did it. But it took her seven minutes and something to do the 30 reps. Then about, I don't know, the next day, 
I told her, I said, well, Natty, let's do touch and goes and, uh, you know, use your technique, but let's do touch and goes and see what happens. And she did touch and goes and she did it with her time went down to two minutes and 45 seconds. Mm, wow. So he, my, I came with a belief that, you know, I don't like bad technique and Grace and Isabel have a tendency to the, the, the untrained person will round their back and cause the time component is really is what they're after. So I came up with a philosophy that look, CrossFit is going to be, especially at the games and the open and the regionals. If you're going to get, if you're going to get grace or Isabel and you have bad technique, then you're going to fatigue harder and faster and you're not going to be able to have the next day's workout recovered. Mm. So I always preached, do your touch and goes if you have to, if you want to get a good time like Natalie did. There's no doubt in my mind that Natalie could do a, an under two minute grace and maybe, maybe, maybe even an, under a one minute grace if, uh, you know, if she trained for it mm. because her technique is flawless. And so I came in with, when I started doing my seminars, I just, I would preach flawless technique makes you recover better and it doesn't use your your muscles it uses your small muscles like your arms but it'll use your legs and you're using natalie snatched 230 pounds you know 105 kilos and so you know 45 kilos for her 95 pounds was nothing mm -hmm. so, so 30 reps for her was very easy and yeah it was fatiguing and it was hard but in about an hour or two, she could, probably could have done the same thing again. Mm. So technique to me is, is really critical. And um, I believe it's, and it was proven to me that I can do touch and goes with good technique. Mm. But if I just do touch and goes and slam it with a rounded back and pulling it up over my head, it's going to be a bad technique. For sure. Absolutely. So um, for our listeners, we want to get into some... Um some nuts and bolts of the weightlifting mic so i think we do some sort of a like a case study who was your um who was one of the best athletes that you've coached in your national um senior teams or your junior women's teams let's choose an athlete and go through some strengths and weaknesses and then your your uh your way to address those strengths and weaknesses can we do that sure i i would have to tell you that my son casey was probably the you know, the best athlete that I coached, you know, and obviously very, uh, you know, it, it's a humbling experience to be able to coach your team, your, your son. Mm. Uh, and, but I had him all the time. You can't, you got to realize that when you're dealing with a, um, a world team, you, you're working with somebody else's athlete. And, uh, yes. uh, you, you gotta be real careful there because even though that I see things that I would want to change, and we go to a world championship, I would, you know, I, I would take the advice of what the coach was that got her to those world championships, how he coached them, and I would be looking for them. But for Casey, I coached Casey, so I brought him up from a, from a seven and an eight year old all the way up to his, through his career. So. And what were his, um, what were his strengths and weaknesses? Casey was, for the listeners, Casey was a, uh... 90 a 94 or a, or a 105 or well he he was all the way through he was yep. uh you know he started out you know as a as a uh a light a very lightweight you know i, I can't even remember the weight classes back then but uh you know he he was he was light he was in the 75 kilo class i believe when he really started moving but yep. he was he was tall and lean tall and thin so the first thing we had to do, we, you know, he was like 5'11", you know, and, and, you know, 75 kilos, that's 165 pounds. And, and he was, a, he was a good lifter, but he needed to put on more weight. So yep. we had to address his eating and his nutrition, first of all. And then when we addressed that, we, uh, we were able to get him much, much stronger and he would recover much faster when he would, uh, when he started gaining the weight that he needed to gain for his frame. And we, we did that by, I'd get up every morning at uh, two o'clock in the morning and make him a thousand calorie protein drink. 
Right. Wow. And, and, uh, <laughs> so yeah. what was uh, what was in it? Everything I could put in it that was uh, <laughs> had a lot had a lot of calories. I, a I, fire it, extinguisher. <laughs> oh, no, it was. I put I put uh, ice cream. Uh, you know, uh, we used raw milk. Uh, uh, I even would be known to throw in a couple of Oreo cookies so you. Oh, this it. is for breakfast. Can you yeah. uh, make me one? Oh, yeah. it out. Can you be my coach? <laughs> Can you be my dad? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was it. He was young, and then, uh, and then you know, he started gaining weight, and then he hit a stand standstill. So then, when he came to my school, to where I taught, he, uh, I made him eat uh, every hour of the on the hour. After his class, he'd have to eat a peanut butter and a banana sandwich. Mm. Did he, so he uh, at any stage, uh, did you and him have any falling outs? Like, were you pushing him to eat and he didn't want to? Or was there any hard times because you were his dad and coach and wanted yeah, the best out of him? Absolutely, there was. He just said he, he didn't want to do this anymore. And uh, he thought that I was too hard on him and he didn't uh, he didn't appreciate that. And uh I said, well, okay, you know, it's your life, it's your sport, you don't have to do it. And that lasted about uh, a week or two, and he loved the sport, and he says, I was just angry, I'd do whatever you tell me to do. And, uh, mm. uh, and, it, and you know, it, in our relationship, it, it was always a family relationship. Mom, mom supported me, so that helped. And if she had a disagreement with me the way I was coaching the kids, not coaching with them with exercises and stuff like that, but the way I'd respond to them, she would do it. She would, we would talk in private. We would never talk in front of the kids. So I, my, my job was the gym and her job was the house. And she would be a listening post for the kids. And then she and I would talk and, uh, and uh, we would agree sometimes and sometimes we wouldn't agree. Mm. So what would you say? Um, what would you say is the most important thing for other people out there that are coaching their kids? Because it's obviously very, very. It's like a minefield of uh, emotional drama that you can go through, ups and downs and highs and lows. Obviously, living together while you're uh, while you got the coach athlete relationship. What's the most important thing that you think that's that's uh, that's needed to keep it a well-oiled machine? Well, I think it's got to be trust. You know, you're 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 going to have your family family issues, you know, I mean, the kids are going to grow up, they're going to be 16. And all of a sudden, they're going to want to drive and they're going to have girlfriends and they're going to have whatever. And Casey and I, you know, when he was a freshman or sophomore in high school, um, went to a weightlifting contest. And we had the normal father son relationship at home. But in the gym, he trusted me in the gym. And, uh, um, he would do everything I said, and, and he made gains. So that trust, uh, it, but it works both ways. You know, he trusted me, but I wouldn't necessarily trust him because <laughs> as a 16-year-old, he would... Be a 16-year-old. Mm. Yeah, he would be a 16-year-old, <laughs> and he would want to be, hey, Dad, uh, I missed that lift, but let me go again. And I had a hard and fast rule that... I'm 30, and, and I still do and, that. <laughs> So you're talking about trust with uh, trust with the father and uh, father son athlete relationship. Yeah, the the, tr- the trust has to, has to be both ways. I was saying is that um, you know I Casey trusted me as his coach, but you know in a weightlifting contest, athletes try to you know they play, try to play head games with you, and they want to if they miss a lift, they want to oh I got I can make that lift. Let me go up and wait, and I never did that. But uh, at, at one contest, uh, uh, Casey w- missed a weight that he should have made. And uh, uh, he said, Dad, I can make this weight. And uh, let, let me take it. And I said, no, we're not going to take this. We're going we're gonna to do what our plan was all along. You missed the weight. We're going to take it. Mm-hmm. He says, well, what if I go in the back room and make it again? And so he had about, uh, he had about two minutes because he was going to follow himself. Yep. So I said, if you're that crazy, let's go back in the back room. And, and he went in the back room and he took it and made it easy. So I moved him up. So the point of this is that I learned to trust him and his judgment as an athlete. Yep. So that, that athlete coach judgment and trust is very, very critical in a relationship of coach athlete. 
So, sure. so Mike, also too, in a general sense, you said before, um, you know, you learned to trust him as well. Did that did come did that come into life? Um, you know, when he'd say, "Hey, look, Dad, I'm I'm going out tonight," or I'm, you know, I'm doing this and that on the weekend. Did you sort of trust him to make the right choices um, when he wasn't home, or you know, when he was out partying or something, so that he would, you know, be able to continue doing weightlifting? He was a very easy. He was easy. Now you talk about my second son, I can tell you a lifetime of stories. But uh, but is the uh, second son is that Bo or is Bo the second son? That, that's Bo. He's a great so, he's a great so, fella. Yeah, but Casey would you know I could always I'd ask Casey a question and he'd always tell me the truth. You know he would he would uh, if you felt guilty about something he would, he would tell me. You know yeah. uh, so you know we all he was always very very good. Um, so yeah, I trusted him, you know, uh, explicitly we had rules that he had to be in it, uh, no later than midnight when he, when he turned, he, he couldn't date until he was 16. Um, right. you know, we had just family rules you like could, that. Couldn't and get a date till you were 21, right, Tommy? I, I yeah. still can't get a date, mate, and I'm nearly 23. So <laughs> <laughs> if you can help me out, if there was any number you know in Nashville. <laughs> Maybe you could get Casey's number, he could yeah. give you a thing or two. Um, yeah, no, that sounds like you've had a good relationship with your uh, with your kids, for sure, Mike. Um, you talked about uh, your your philosophy with breaking um, uh, breaking rules and and uh, going for PRs and such and, and competition um, competition weights and setting your uh, setting your weights there. So, as far as for our listeners, as far as PRs, so um, what's your stance on PRs and? Uh, and kind of trying to set up for a PR. Are you one of the people that goes for a one kilo jump? Are you want somebody that lets people go for a five kilo jump? Do you have a philosophy there? Well, it just it always depends on the competition. You know, I mean, if if if, it, if you're at the world championships, I'm gonna we're gonna start out conservative. You know, you're gonna get in the hunt. That's the mm-hmm. number one. So let's say you have a 170 kilo snatch. Um, you know, and that and that's what you. You say, well, I want to start at 165, and uh, I would never let you do that. Yep. You know, uh, I mean, I would, I, you might do it, but I would, I would put down probably a 155 uh, opener. You yes, know, maybe sure. maybe a 160, and then I would put that in there, and I would see how you look that day, because you know you have to lose weight. Uh, you know the the overseas flights or the you know, the not sleeping in your own bed all have a, you know, they all have, a, a, you know, a consequence uh, to how you feel that particular day. So if if uh, if an athlete wants to start with 165, I would always put down 155, um, you know, and then I would then I'd warm him up and I'd explain my philosophy to him. And if he looked good and I felt comfortable with it, then I'd start him with 165. But I'd make sure that he was in the hunt because some guys, some guys train ten pounds overweight, five kilos overweight. And now they're reducing down, and they want to. Their, their record is, you know, 170, 175 at that at that five kilo mm-hmm. uh, mm. over body weight. So you got to always take that into consideration. You got to take in the travel. So, so, so with the just touching on the um, the weight cutting thing, what's your what is a healthy range for you? I'm a. I'm just talking something that I'm genuinely interested in. I'm discussing it always with my uh, with my coach. I'm an 85 kilo weightlifter, but I'm kind of in between at the moment. So I walk around at 82, 83. I've been up to 85, 86. What's a What's a good range if you want to be an 85 or a 94 kilo weightlifter? What's the top end that you can realistically walk around at and then come down and compete well? Cutting well, for, yeah. About two weeks out, I, I would probably let you train as an 85. I'd let you train around 89 or 90. Yep. Oh, really? And, yeah, I'd let you go that high. But at two weeks out, we'd really start reducing down. There's a lot of things into play here. And, and every athlete is different as well. Erin um, Akinek was one of my lifters. And she was a 70, a 69 kilo lifter. But she, uh, you know, she, she would be 74 kilos. Mm-hmm. And then she'd have to reduce down. So I just said, forget it. We're going to go. We're going to lift it as a seventy-five. I don't want you reducing down that much. Well, she, she's an athlete that was nervous, 
And, you know, uh, the first meat I lifted her as a 75, she weighed 69.8. Mm. Right. And because she was a nervous athlete. So you have to, you have to know that. You have to know that athlete. Do you, think you, know, it, do you factor in uh, metabolism as well once you get to know your athletes and then some of them can kind of come down from five kilos quite easily and then some of them find it a bit more difficult or does that come into play? Yeah, I think so. But, you know, the real thing is is the, the, the eating patterns that you have. I mean, to, today you take a look at a, a, uh, an athlete that is eating really lean and clean, you know, they're, and, and they're, at the, at, they're at the top of the weight you know, they're weighing, they're weighing, uh, uh, well, Jessica LeSurl, for an example, is, is at 58, and she's training at, at 60 to 61, mm-hmm. and she has nothing. She's eating clean. She has nothing to lose. Yeah, So hard. for her, you know, I would, even at 60 would be, 60 kilos is tough. And yeah. now you're, you're sitting in the sauna, and you're miserable because you're not eating. My philosophy is is I don't like to reduce weight. I like to gain the weight. Yeah, for sure. So you would uh, you would get her to gain weight to go to the next category? I would. That, but you know, Amy and I are, or Everett is her coach, and she used to be my athlete. And uh, you know, Jessica holds all the national records as a fifty eight. But you know, she's uh, she could she could easily hold sixty three. But that's a very tough class too. So, I want to. Um, oh, sorry, sorry to cut you off. Um, no, that's right. I, I want to touch back on when you were talking about getting your athletes to bulk up and the diet that you had Casey on. Um, my weightlifting coach, he he kind of has the same philosophy. So he told me he wanted me to be a, a big eighty-five. So he put me on what he calls a dirty bulk diet, where I would um, I would eat. Dirt. I would eat sugar. I would eat a lot of shit. Like what you were saying with Casey's shake that right. you would make him in the morning. So with if you want an athlete to to bulk up, tell us how you go about that. Obviously, it sounds like you don't really have to put a whole lot of emphasis on the nutrition value. On, on the nutritional value, yeah. Mm. It's just it's just you want that actual mass on your body, so calories you're happy to and... get those calories in in any way. Is that yep. Well it, it's it's not it's not as simple as that. I mean it's, I'm not gonna have him eating ding-dongs and donuts and stuff like that. But I'm going to have them eating a lot of meat. Yeah, yeah for an example, Casey's, we had a sponsor at one time with that had um, uh, emus. Do you know what an emu is? We, uh, yeah. we do, yeah. Yeah, okay. So this guy sponsored us, and he, he would give us, um, you know, emu steaks and burgers and what have you. And emu eggs, and if you've ever seen an emu egg, you know how big that those suckers are. Oh yeah. And and so, I I made Casey eat an emu steak in the morning with an emu egg, and that's <laughs> after the that two o'clock feeding. Wow. So, and then now you're looking at the peanut butter and you know jelly and stuff like that. You know, I I just I just put in a lot of calories on him, but it. And yeah. if, if he ate a candy bar or if he ate a donut once in a while, that didn't matter to me. I didn't care. So if it was wanted... good, good food, but then the, the in-between fillers were uh, sure. a little bit more calorically dense and, uh, yeah. and stuff to get that extra pack. And, and pack I, would, I would take him out and go get a pizza. If he wanted a pizza, I'd have him get a pizza. And he, and he loved milk, and so we drank whole milk, whole raw milk. Yep. So... Um, do you do uh, do you do all of the nutritional plans for your athletes, or you leave that up to them, or how do you go about that? Well, I don't. Right now, I don't coach any athletes. I'm you know I'm just doing the CrossFit stuff. So, I'm we're pretty much you know mid paleo. You know, uh, sometimes we'll do a whole thirty. I've lost uh, you know thirty pounds by cleaning up my diet and. Uh, uh, yeah, you're looking good, mate. I can see you before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, we're doing a lot of it uh, for the geezers who are my athletes now. We do a lot of intermittent fasting and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, great. but you know, if I was coaching a, uh, a national caliber athlete right now, I would I would really get into that athlete's head and get to know them and what they could do and what they couldn't do as far as the weight and nutrition is concerned. I believe in good nutrition, uh, but I don't, you know, I don't particularly 
I've lost weight, but if I'm on vacation, I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat uh, whatever the hell I want to eat, and then I'll come back home and and, uh, and then I'll <laughs> and then, then I'll do yeah, do it again, right? Um, so Mike, you touched before on the paleo diet. There's a lot of people that sort of say, you know, generally doing, um, CrossFit, you know, the CrossFit lifestyle with, with the paleo diet sort of works pretty well, but what would you say is the best way to approach the paleo diet? If you are that CrossFit, um, trained athlete or that, that CrossFit athlete that's looking to do sort of, you know, training more than once a day, do you think the, the, the range in paleo, um, offers enough energy to, to be blunt? Absolutely not. Ask ask uh, uh, Rich Froning, you know, what his diet is. Yeah, and yeah. He'll, and, he'll, and he'll tell you, I eat whatever I want to eat. If yeah. I want to eat donuts, I'll eat donuts. If I want to eat, you know, I mean, nutrition is, is very important. But, you know, athleticism and the body, knowing your body and, and you're having results is the most important thing. I mean, Froning can eat what he can eat a... A, a dozen donuts every night and probably wouldn't affect him. That That's just him. So you have to find that out about your athlete. And if he did start eating a dozen donuts every night and his, his performance came down and he started, you know, he couldn't recover and couldn't do the things, then you address that. You know, oh, yeah. so you start out by, you know, getting clean and see what, see what happens. See what, if I if I eat clean and if I do like a whole thirty challenge or a whole forty challenge, or I do a paleo and I lose my body fat and my performance goes up, then that that tells you what it is. But if uh, you know it, it's hard to you know to be strict all the time, you know. And uh, um, but at the same time, oh. some junk and stuff, whatever. And your performance is up. Hell, I'm not going to change it. Yeah. Of course, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you said before, Rich Froning, you sort of made the whole non-paleo diet famous. So I remember there's that that video of him eating probably about 17 pigs on one barbecue. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I first saw it. And then he washed it down with some ice cream. So you're right. Just uh, you're making yeah. the uh, making sure that you you work what's the rest uh, rest for your body. Well, you got to know the coach has got to know his athlete. You know, that's that's the key. You got to that's that trust that you're talking about. You got to you got to know your person that you're dealing with and what what what's inside his head, you know. And that's why I don't like percents on weightlifting. You know, I'd rather I'd rather say we're going to do uh, five sets of three in the front squat today, but I don't want any misses. Mm. So the athlete learns to judge, you know, how he feels on that particular day. And and I like to use the perceived exertion scale, the one to ten, ten ten being it's just, oh my God, I just barely made it. Mm-hmm. And one, you could, you know, it's just nothing. So if, you know, today, you know, I ask you to do 80% and that 80% feels like a 10, what are you going to do? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good um, piece to touch on there, Mike. So that's kind of what I wanted to know is what do you feel about training kind of the Bulgarian method where you'll max out a lot do you train um do you let your athletes train by field or they have to stick to the program mainly talking about heavy days how often and how would you how do you approach them well the the heavy day depends on the day that you know the way you feel yep. i mean did you get in a fight with your girlfriend did you do you have a test you have to do did your did your uh, uh are you fired from your job because all of that is dependent on the day's work that you can do. Yep. And, sure. and I, I will tell I love the Bulgarian program, but you know, what is heavy? You know, they put a percent on something and they, they, that's heavy, but that, that 95% that they have written on paper is, Could, is it's, it, you can't do it. Yeah. So yeah. What, it, it may be 85%. Yeah. For sure. So, 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 so you know how you feel as long as you don't miss. Okay. So, in saying that, how often would you actually have a work to a max um, day? Just just to put things into perspective, um, the way that I train, our coaches only max us out in preparation for a comp. So two weeks out, we'll have we'll test our lifts, and then we'll have our deload week. We'll we'll go heavy obviously on the day of the comp, but we're obviously on the lower end of the spectrum, so we don't max out a lot at my particular club or with my particular coach. 
how many times in the training year, say there's a three-month period where you're training for a certain event, how many times inside of that three-month period before the event would you actually say, okay, depending on how you feel, let's max out, let's test it out. How often would you go about it? I do that every Saturday. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Every, every Saturday was a day that was controlled by me. It was a snatch, clean, and jerk, and squat. Really? Yeah. And But, I mean, I, I'm watching them. I'm looking to see how they feel. And I know my athletes. So if an athlete is looking really good, and if the frying pan's hot, you got to do the cooking. For sure. And so when would you call that session off? Is it as soon as they miss? Yes. As soon as I, I always gave, and I've done this in, in, you know, four, three or four weeks out from a contest, the athlete is missing weights. Then what I would do is I would take that athlete back. I mean, they're good misses. They're not... They're not poor misses. They're good misses. I would take the athlete back down to start again and bring him back up. And if he did it again, I'd, I've been known to do it again, mm. and he'd get a personal best. And so how often uh, – well, then how do you teach your athletes to deal with missing a lift if they don't miss lifts in training? Well, that's that's the idea. If you remember that girl from Russia, Kat- Katrina, I think her name is. Mm-hmm. The big super heavyweight? Yes, yes, I know it. Yeah. They asked her a question. They said, they asked her, her a question and their coach. They said, uh, do you, do you, when, when was the last time you missed? And they both looked at each other and they both said that they had missed in training or in a contest mm. for a very, very, very long time. And, and that's, that's, that's that trust again. You know, the coach has got to know his athlete and the athlete's got to know his coach. And the athlete is his worst enemy. And, you know, you take an athlete and you put 90% on there because, you know, today's a 90% day. I want you to hit that 90%. But he feels like shit. But what's the athlete going to do? Mm. He's going he's gonna to try to hit that 90%. He's going to try course, to hit yeah. it. And he's just going to force it and, and he could become injured. Mm, he yeah. can, it could be non-recovered. So it's just I bad for the mental side of things as well. Oh my really, God, isn't it? That, yeah. the, the mental side of it is probably the most important part. Yeah. But you know, and, 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 and then there's the training program. I, I have a program where I'm, I go through strength cycles. When I go through a strength cycle, you got to understand that when I'm doing the strength cycle, that uh, uh, it's very important for me to, to understand that the snatch and clean and jerk are going to be, they're going to be lesser. Mm-hmm. So if I'm squat pulling and pressing, then uh, then I got to know that my snatch and clean and jerk are not going to be as good. I'm not going to squat pull press heavy, trying to go heavy, and then in the same cycle expect mm-hmm. my snatch and clean and jerk to be at its best. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So I've I- got, I've got to, I've got to work that around where. I, I want to go through strength cycles on a, a way out, and then uh, uh, and then I want to do uh, you know I want to emphasize the snatch and clean and jerks and their weaknesses. Yeah, for sure. I actually um, I actually touching back on the the, the Russian um, super heavyweight. That's kind of how how we trained, and that's the the mindset. I mean, it's all depending on what your coach um, what his philosophy is. But right. I stepped foot on the platform feeling like I missed three or four snatches in a space of about six months. Clean and jerk is a bit different because my jerk was a bit off. But I would step up to the platform, put my feet under the bar, and I would know that the bar's going overhead. So, But it, like, like you say, it works different with, um, with everybody. And right. uh, just interesting to hear your, uh, hear your take. Hey, um, Mike, would you, uh, would you have your athletes look at their heart rate variability or any sort of measures to see if they're overtrained or under-recovered? Absolutely. The best, the best thing that I have is a vertical jump. Yep. You know, you have force plates and I can't afford it. So if, if I, uh, if I'm concerned about an athlete, you know, when I get them, I test them in the vertical jump to see where it is. And then, uh, you know, any particular day, you know, they're, they're feeling good or bad or whatever. I'll Mm. test them in the vertical jump. And if the vertical jump is where it needs to be, then they're recovered. They're doing well. They're, they're, uh, they're, they may be messed up in the head, but that's that's yeah. a different story. But if, if their vertical jump is down, 
then you know they're not recovered enough. Yeah, I had a, uh, I had a heart rate variability app that I used to test myself each morning, and that would uh, obviously test the, the rhythm in between my heartbeats, and that would give an indication of uh, how heavy or how hard you should be training that day. And yeah. often mentally I felt good, but physiologically I, I you know, was under, uh, under recovered, so I would take it light. So it was a really good tool or a measure to um, sort of keep your training sort of, you know, on yeah, track. you can't you to me physically i i really believe physically you you can train heavy whatever heavy is all the time but you can't do it mentally mm. you know there's 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 times that you know a, a kid is lifting what you think is light weight for him but they look like shit they're just they just look terrible so what do you do? I send them. I send them home, or I tell them to go sauna, go jacuzzi, just get you know get out of here and uh, uh, go refresh. Don't feel bad. Yeah, just let's let's just refresh. Let's get recovered. So I've done that before several times with kids, and uh, you know, but yeah, physically they're fine, but mentally they're they're messed up. You know, so. Mm. Now, Mike, we had a uh, we had a question from one of our listeners that wanted to talk about that mental prep or that mental game right before they go um, go for your lift. So you see a lot of people. I'm um, just Lucas Parker, the CrossFit athlete, comes to mind right now. Who's he's got his routine before the bar? He always steps up. He's he's got his hands together. He's touching the weights. He's he's doing his thing, and it's so so. Um, you know, planned and, and practiced. What would what would you say um, is sort of the best way to approach the bar? And are you a, a big believer in um, a dynamic start or someone that just you know mentally prepares himself, relaxes, and then lifts? Well, I think I think that you know here's 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 two good comparisons. So you got Lucas Parker that does his thing and it's methodical. It's the same every single time. And I would tell you that probably ninety percent of the lifters. That's the approach that they take. That's the approach I took. But then you get a guy like Ilya. Mm. What does he do? He chalks up, he goes over, gets on the bar and lifts it. He doesn't mm. even think. So That's, that's right. It, it, it's just, you know, I don't believe in teaching a beginning lifter to dynamic start. we got to get that starting position held out first. Uh, so we'll do a static start. And then as they progress – and they want to learn the dynamic start, then we'll go ahead and teach them. But my the, the feelings that I have, I want my athlete to go to the same routine that they that they go through in practice. So in practice, when we do our snatches and clean and jerks, I warm the athlete up in practice the same way he's going to warm up in a meet. And when he addresses the bar, he addresses the bar on every lift the same way he's going to address the bar in a meet. And, you know, some athletes stomp their feet. Natalie, my daughter-in-law, would scuff her feet before she would go up on the bar. She would very methodically put her toes underneath the bar. She would stand up, visualize, take a deep breath, and then go down to the bar. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that was you... – can, can you hold on one minute? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Coach Bergner. <laughs> we'll just uh we may as well oh, okay. leave this, Hold yeah, on. this bit I, in the show I, I sure. will be sorry sorry guys check. mike's uh obviously doing what he's doing i'm, I'm, uh, I'm on an interview right now but i'll be over there in just a second <laughs> in early. okay I'll, I'll be in a black pickup truck we just stay out front okay <laughs> Black pickup truck. Come on, mate. It's a black pickup truck. Come on. <laughs> There's not many out there. There's not many. <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys. I got – this went too far. She got uh, – the my athlete got in or the intern got in, so I got to go pick her up. Sure. All righty. Sure. So do you, have, um, do you have a couple more minutes? We can just do nine, uh, nine quick fire answers that we normally do to finish the show, Mike. All right. Quickly. All righty. So, Max, start us off. Uh, what's your morning ritual? Uh – a, a uh, drink of uh, turmeric. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> turmeric. Turmeric. The turmeric, natural yeah. anti-inflammatory. Uh, yep. Do you meditate? Uh, sometimes. If you had one day left in the world, how would you spend it? With my family. Good Love answer. It. Good answer. All right. And three for me. Uh, your favorite travel destination you've been to and why? Or you don't even Finland, need that and why? Because I like the South South End, or not Finland, uh, uh, New Zealand, the South End, and uh, Queenstown. Oh, beautiful spot. 
And uh, your dream destination, somewhere you haven't been that you can't wait to get to? Uh, uh, you know what? I've been all over the world and I couldn't pick one out. Uh, my homeland is Switzerland, so I'd go oh. back there probably. Well, wow. beautiful. And if you had, uh, if you're on a desert island, you had three things to keep you sane, what would they be? Say that if I had three things, what? If you're on a desert island and you had three things that you could have with you to keep you sane, what would they be? My wife and uh, a dog and uh, a cold beer. Beautiful. Love it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to come to your island. <laughs> um, mate, uh, what do you do when you have some downtime? Ride my motorcycle. Love it. Um, if you could invite three people to dinner, dead or alive, who would they be? My mother and father and, um, oh boy, I guess it would be my grandfather. So I take it you're not a family man? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's excellent. And uh, I'm going to throw in another one. Um, what, uh, who was your role model as a, as a child? Oh boy. Uh, Davy Crockett as a young child. Oh. Davy Crockett. <laughs> Davy Crockett, I wanted to be that. And then as I got older, it became John Wayne. Ah, very good. Can you do a uh, John Wayne impersonation for us, mate? <laughs> <laughs> I'll Take give it a, a no. go if I can. <laughs> I'm a John Wayne. And, no, uh... I, 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 I can't. He's been gone so long. I, I just, I love, my favorite movie is True Grit, and I love John oh, Wayne. Oh, that's ah, a great movie. Fantastic movie, isn't it? Yeah. Good movie. All right, so um, thanks for your time, Mike. Before you shoot off, is there anything you'd like to plug on the air? Anything that you're working on, CrossFit weightlifting or your gym? Or? No, CrossFit weightlifting is the best. We have a CrossFit weightlifting website where we uh, give uh, workouts for free. We don't charge anybody because we feel very blessed to be in part of CrossFit and uh, support weightlifting and support uh, CrossFit the best you can. Beautiful. And uh, where can people find you online or... Uh, uh, social media channels anywhere in particular people can come to yeah. HB? Yeah, people can use email address is mikebergner at mac.com. Uh, you know, I'm on Facebook. Uh, um, you know, you got my, you know, Skype, my phone number is 760 535 What's your home address? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's all 32067 Via Vera, Bonzo, California. Oh, you got it all. <laughs> there you go, yeah. listeners. All right, Mike. Well, uh, thanks a lot for taking time out of your day to have a chat with us. Thanks, Coach B. Thanks, Mike. You bet, guys. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, and that's it from us. Thank you. All right. Take care. Well, there we go, guys. That was our first ever Skype interview. Like I said, give us feedback. Email me personally, doc at adventurefittravel.com. Email radio at adventurefittravel.com. Write on our Facebook, write on our walls. Let us know what you thought. We're always trying to improve. We want to be better so you guys have a better experience and, uh, and that's what we're all about. <clears throat> if you like the show, go onto iTunes and subscribe. And also, if you wanted some extra information from our show notes, anything that we mentioned in the show, that'll be linked in our show notes. They can be found at www.adventurefittravel.com forward slash podcast. While you're there, jump onto our mailing list. There'll be pop-ups. There's a little box at the top of the, uh, top of the, top of the webpage there. <clears throat> there's uh, ways to sign up all over our site. You'll also get $250 gift voucher, I believe. Yes, you will. Uh, and also, you if you do sign up, you'll make sure to get all of our latest updates and all of our uh, all of our trips and giveaways and all the good stuff that we've got going on. I didn't say that one too clearly. Sorry about that. I'm all over the place. Um, but we also, before we go, have to thank our sponsors. So, audible.com. Check out, guys, Audible. Fuck reading, fuck picking a book up and flicking through it day by day. Why don't you just read while you're working, read while you're driving? It's get that information in. Anyway, you can. Audible is a great way to do that. Check out www.audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio. Check out The Martian. That's my recommendation for an audiobook. Only joking about the reading thing, guys. Make sure you read every day, but just get some extra stuff in while you drive. It's way better than the radio. All right, Loxam Solutions. For all your boutique uh, business and consulting needs, head to www.loxamsolutions.com.au. NDO SUPS, use ADVF Radio at checkout. Uh, head to www.ndosups.com for that. And lastly, AdventureFit Travel, get on board. Hashtag, are you AdventureFit? Hashtag, all that shit. Um, just check us out online. You'll have a ball. Check out our reviews. Check out our testimonials. 
they're uh, they're off the chain. That's it from us. See you next week. Discovery Roger, go for deploy.